Hey Art History, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Romanticism, but before we get into the lecture, I of course want to reiterate as always um, that before you watch this video, you should have already read about the artworks on Can Academy or watch the videos that are provided there as well. Uh, I know many of you have, many of you have been keeping up with the artworks and I really appreciate that. Um, so um, knowing those artworks beforehand will have this little context video make a lot more sense. Uh, I'm really going to be hitting the high points of what Romanticism is uh, because it is many things and I will take us through um, those artworks um, as they apply to Romanticism. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our lecture on Romanticism. We left off last week at the end of the revolutionary period in France and America. Revolutions that perhaps would not have occurred, but for Enlightenment thought. The neoclassic style reigned almost supreme as the best style to convey the ideas of the Enlightenment and burgeoning democracy. However, neoclassicism would soon give way to romanticism, a movement seen in literature, the visual arts, and even music. And I want to stop here just to mention that in some ways romanticism and neoclassicism are concurrent movements. So I don't want to give you the idea that neoclassicism came and then it stopped and then it was romanticism. Uh, these are just li little labels that art historians use to help organize art and styles, but I don't want you to think that anything is <laughs> concrete. Everything sort of blends together and even aspects of neoclassical painting have romantic aspects of them and, and vice versa. Um, so just be aware that these are labels and nothing is as neat and tidy as we sometimes make it out to be. So, Romanticism encompasses many ideas and will manifest itself in many ways visually, but one of the many interests of the movement was the irrational. In this sense, we can understand Romanticism as a reaction to the Enlightenment, which believed strongly in the rational capacity of man. Romanticism instead recognizes man's capacity for irrationality, for violence, for horror. For our purposes, Francisco de Goya bridges the gap between the Enlightenment and Romanticism. Born in 1746, he came of age at the height of Enlightenment thinking. His print series, Los Caprichos, published in 1799, focuses on social commentary, not unlike our Hogarth, satirical painting of the upper classes that we see here. The series by Goya ridicules, and I quote from Goya himself, the, quote, multitude of extravagances and follies, unquote, shared by society. The most famous print from the series, which is commonly reproduced in history textbooks, is The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters, shown here. The allegorical figure of reason naps, oblivious to the horrible flock of night creatures that materialize out of the darkness behind him. Though the print, through the print, Goyle warns the viewer of what is sure to happen if they do not keep their wits about them at all times. Unfortunately, Goyle would live to see the results of the sleep of reason, which brings us to our artwork by Goya. And there is nothing to be done from his print series, The Disasters of War. The French Revolution ended when Napoleon Bonaparte, who we see here in this very romantic painting by Jacques-Louis David. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte rose to power in 1800 at the tail end of the French Revolution and waged war on much of continental Europe until 1815, including Spain, beginning in 1808. Goya witnessed the destruction wrought by both Napoleonic forces and Spanish forces against each other, civilians, and the landscape itself. There is no glory in war as depicted by Goya, unlike what we saw in David's Oath of the Horatii. There is only the certainty of endless death carried out by anonymous soldiers on anonymous victims. In fact, the soldiers become little more than the weapons they 
carry as attested by the unforgivingly straight lines of gun barrels that pierce the right side of this composition. And I have to say that I know I have seen this print before, but I don't know that I had actually noticed those gun barrels before. The title only adds to the hopeless despair of the scene. There is nothing to be done. There is no choice but to kill and die. Humanity is caught in a nightmare of its own making where the light of logic and reason cannot reach. Another artist that bridges the gap between enlightenment idealism and romantic dreams is Jean-Auguste Dominique Ancre, a student of Jacques-Louis David from who he learned his classicizing idealized style that under Ancre's brush intensifies into a cool slickness, a startling smoothness that we see in the flesh of La Grande Orlice of 1814. The female nude has a long tradition in Western art, going all the way back to the Renaissance, as seen in our Titian, the Venus of Urbino. Rather than place his nude in the acceptable classical past, however, he situates her in the Turkish harem. She becomes an exotic other, other with a capital O. 19th century Europe was or rather developed a fascination with the worlds of the near and far east, as well as the savage wilderness of the American frontier. Europeans considered these places as more or less uncivilized, despite the fact that all of these places were home to their own flourishing civilizations. It was simply that they were not civilized according to Western custom and thus strange, exotic, and mysterious. Ancre provides the viewer with a glimpse into the strange, mysterious world of the harem, or at least how he imagined it, for the scene is a complete fabrication. The painting tells us more about the not-so-secret desires of the viewer. When we talked about Titian's Venus, I pointed out that the nude's title of Venus simply provided a veneer of propriety. One can gaze upon the nude and not feel guilty or scandalized because she is a Venus. The same applies with our Odalise. We can look at her without guilt because she does not belong to our world, or rather the world of 19th century France. Despite this exotic fantasy, which caught him uh, rather a lot of flack, Ancre would eventually end up holding the line against the greatest excesses, as some critics saw it, of romanticism. Ancre's style would remain essentially neoclassic with its emphasis on linear form, and that style would still be taught in the academies. Their days, though, are numbered. Uh, painters like Eugène Delacroix, often set as a foil to Ancre, would offer another alternative, more in line with romantic aims. Let's pause for a moment and catalog some of the characteristics of romanticism that we've seen so far. A reaction of enlightenment rationalism, a reaction to enlightenment rationalism and its optimism in humanity, which we noted in Goya, and an interest in exotic cultures and places as seen in Ancre. The overarching concern of romantic thought was the primacy of emotion and feeling. Romantics did not just reject rationality, but lifted up emotion in its place, whether it was the terror of Goya, the mysterious pleasure of the Odalisque, or anything in between. The privileging of emotion is seen especially, on our list at least, in the work of Delacroix, via Liberty Leading the People. I love this painting. I think it's hard not to, but it's okay if you don't, don't feel the same way. This painting is a tour de force in the gamut of emotions brought on by revolution. Yes, another revolution. They were rather the thing to do in France during the 19th century. Anyways, this commemorates the July Revolution of 1830. The entire population of Paris, it seems, surges towards the viewer, led by the allegorical liberty. We can feel the unfettered excitement of the young boy shooting his pistols wildly into the air the grim determination of the laborer and the middle-class man on the left pushing ever forward. We feel the hope Liberty inspires in the figure that looks up at her, yet we feel pity for the corpses strewn across the foreground. It's simply breathtaking. Breathtaking. 
That's a great word to describe a lot of romantic art, especially when it comes to landscapes and seascapes. Nature was a prime place to encounter the sublime, which was defined by British philosopher Edmund Burke as a feeling of terror and awe combined. And nowhere could this be experienced more clearly than when contemplating misty mountain heights, sweeping vistas, and ferocious storms. We get glimpses of the sublime in two paintings on our list, the first being the Oxbow by American painter Thomas Cole. And yes, he was born in Britain and emigrated to America later, but we will just claim him as American. The Oxbow is typical of landscapes by the Hudson River School, a loose association of American landscape painters. It features a panoramic view of the American landscape that stretches deep into the depths of the painting, seemingly inf infinite. Cole touches upon the sublime in this painting with a tempestuous storm that feel fills the left side of the painting, a ruined, blasted tree suggesting the terrifying power of nature. However, though nature has the power to evoke awe in humanity, she is not omnipotent, all-powerful. Instead, the right side of the painting suggests the power of humanity to tame and harness nature for its own purposes. Though we here in 2020 now recognize the devastating effects humanity has wrought upon nature, 19th century America considered settling the wilds of the continent its manifest destiny, ever westward. Now, I want to point out something that may or may not be there, but it is simply a connection I make. Take that as a warning to maybe not mention this in an essay on the AP exam if you get asked to write about this painting. Anyways, we've already established that wild nature is on the left and tamed, productive, cultivated nature is on the right. Let's talk about left and right as directions and sides of the body, which I may have mentioned in class before. The left in the West has always been rather suspect, considered unlucky, deviant even. In Italian, the word for left is sinistra, which is very similar to the Latin word for left, or comes out of the Latin word for left. In English, though, that word becomes sinister, a synonym for evil. In France, the word for left is gauche, but gauche is also used to describe something tawdry or in bad taste, tacky. My great-grandmother, who, natu who was naturally left-handed, was forced to write with her right hand because her left was quote unquote wrong. Now I say all that to say, and I am only making connections here, I cannot stress this enough, that isn't it interesting that untamed, wild, stormy nature is on the left and cultivated, peaceful, sunshiny nature is on the right. Now, I am not suggesting that Cole saw wild nature as evil or unlucky or anything like that at all. Like most romantic artists, he had a great appreciation for nature. Cole prized the American wilderness because it was so untouched by Western civilization. Indeed, he thought, and I pull from his writings here, that the contemplation of scenes of nature led one to naturally contemplate, quote, God the creator, for they are his undefiled works, and the mind is cast into the contemplation of eternal things." Unquote. What I might tentatively suggest, however, is that not only is cultivated nature on the physical right side of the painting, but it is also on the right side, the moral right side, which would certainly be in line with manifest destiny. Again, this is simply my brain making connections. We could most certainly say that the right and left sides of the painting simply correspond with the progression of the American frontier from east to west. It just, it just all works out rather conveniently, I think. Anyways, our last artwork for today also combines the sublime with a moral imperative. J.M.W. Turner's The Slave Ship. Turner thrusts the viewer into the roiling waters of a typhoon that strips the visible world of nearly all recognizable form. The ship itself is only a silhouette of a few diagonal lines, nearly lost amidst the masses of formless color. 
What is the rain, the sea, the sky? All collide together in this perfect sublime storm. But we cannot get caught up in the emotional intensity of the storm alone. Turner, Turner does not allow it. For there, in the foreground, hands and feet and shackles flash before our eyes. Splotches of red materialize into blood on the water surface. Slaves dumped for insurance money. If we can stand in awe of the fearsome power of nature, we must also stand in terror of man's utter depravity. Turner allows us no other choice. Turner's paintings really must be seen in person because the paint takes on a life of its own and the marks of the artist are clearly visible on the canvas. Turner's acknowledgement of the materiality of paint and his freeing of color from form is one of many steps artists will take on the path towards pure abstraction that continues throughout the 19th century and into the 20th. And that is the end of our lecture on romanticism. And I hope that next week I will be taking you through the rest of the 19th century and into the early 20th century at least um, with Impressionism and Post-Impressionism and Cubism on our path to pure abstraction. Now, today is May the 1st. We have 15 days until the AP exam. Um, and I think after next week's lecture, uh, we are going to focus in on some essay writing so that you can be prepared for uh, the two questions that will be on your exam. All right. Um, I really enjoy making these videos for you all, though, and I hope you enjoy watching them. Until next time.